Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. Continuing from all the events that <clears throat> brought me here now in the present time, I'm in the shoe. As I've, as I've told you, I was waiting to go to a halfway house. My counselor put me in for a halfway house. You know, before, when they put you in for a halfway house, they have this network <clears throat> that they punch your name in that notifies all the police authority throughout the United States of America to see if you have a warrant. So she puts me into the system and three weeks later it came back clear. And she's like, hey, you're cleared, you're ready to go. She brings the papers and stuff for me to sign. I'm signing for my halfway house. And then <clears throat> a week later, she calls me back and she tells, oh, your name popped up. <clears throat> I like my name popped up for what? She said, you got five warrants in the state of Utah. I said, you just told me I was cleared. You know, that's what we were waiting for the last three weeks. You said I was cleared. Oh, well, you slipped through the crack. So how you slip through the crack? You punch in my name, you enter into the computer. It's a nationwide system. There's no slipping through the crack. Well, anyways, like, oh, well, you got warrants and stuff, so you can't send you to a halfway house right now until you get the warrant, the warrant cleared. <clears throat> so as I'm going through the process of trying to get the warrant clear, all this stuff blows up in my block, and now I'm in the shoe. I'm in the shoe pending a homicide investigation attached to whatever incident that happened in the block. But as I'm trying to fight my case, you know, I'm talking to the counselors, I'm talking to the unit manager, I'm talking to the case manager. I'm like, hey, can I get a warrant? Can I get a list of the warrants they got on me? And they're like, well, we can't do that. <clears throat> I'm like, what the fuck you mean you can't do that? <clears throat> they're saying, oh, that's, that's for you to do. So, you know, I spaz out on them. I'm like, what the hell you mean it's for me to do? You guys are the one that told me I got a warrant. Well, this is not our job. I said, what? I said, you're the counselor. You're the case manager. You're the unit team manager. When I read the handbook, when I came in, said, if I have any issues or anything, go to you guys and you guys help me. Help me get home. Help me program. Help me this. Help me that. And now you're telling me, oh, it don't got nothing to do with you? Now, just imagine those people that don't have the resources that I have out here in the streets. I have my wife out here. So I said, you know, she was, over, she was able to go to the courthouse and go to the different departments out here in Utah to find out what was going on. She went down to the state courthouse and they're like, we don't know anything about no warrants. And they had to look at it. They had to say, they're like, hey, um, can you come back in a couple weeks? while we look this thing up. So they look it up. They didn't even have it in their computer. The case was so old. It was back in 1998. They had to go back into the archives and dug and, and dig it up. So when they found all the stuff, they tell me they appointed me an attorney. So they gave me a number and I had my wife call them. And this attorney that my wife talked to we're saying, oh, we're, gonna, we're looking into it. We just hired an investigator to go locate the witnesses. So when I called her and she relayed that message to me, I said, babe, why would my freaking attorney go and try to locate witnesses on a freaking 24-year-old case, right? So I didn't panic or anything, but <clears throat> I started getting a little concerned. You know, when I got arrested... They arrested me for 14 robberies, 12 kidnappings, and seven attempted murders. But they were all state cases except for my bank robbery case. So when I got sentenced to the 26th year for the bank robbery and the assault on the federal officer, the state didn't pursue me. When I went to Lompoc, I filed a motion for them to come and get me. I filed writ or habeas corpus, meaning that, hey, I'm notifying the courts. You guys got charges on me. I'm being detained and housed in Lompoc, California. I want to 
go ahead and resolve these cases. So this is back in 2001 when I did that. And fortunately, I have records of all of those. So when I called my friend, Deirdre Gorman, who represented me on my appeal for my bank robbery case and my assault case, she went and looked them up. And we got records showing that we made an effort to come before the court, but the prosecutor didn't recognize me as a legitimate vehicle to bring my case. He's like, oh, he went pro se. We don't recognize that. But pro se, understand, means you representing yourself. And it is legal statute. Like, you can go to court and present yourself pro se. But the prosecutor in the state at the time didn't want to deal with me because I was an attorney. But that's his fault. Because at the end of the day, you know, they had to acknowledge that I made an effort to file a petition, a motion to come before the courts. But going back to this attorney that was telling my wife that he had hired an investigator to go look for witnesses on these old cases. When I relayed that to my uh, attorney, Deirdre Gorman, she's like, that doesn't sound like an attorney. Because, you know, your attorney is supposed to represent your best interest. And if your attorney look, sees that it's an old case, he's not going to go look for a case, look for witnesses to build a case. So I gave her the name of this individual that my wife had relayed to me. And she found out that this motherfucker was not an attorney. He was a prosecutor, but he was portraying himself as an attorney to my wife as if he was representing me. I say that to let you guys know how the justice system really works. When you get a public defender, you're not paying that public defender a dime. The people that pay the public defender is the same people that pay the judges and the prosecutors and the prison that holds you. So understand that these public defenders or anybody they work for the people that pays them. So if you get a public defender, you're not giving him a dime. So right off the top, he's not working for you. He or she is not working for you because you're not the one that's cutting the check. And if you think anything different, you're setting yourself up for a disappointment. <clears throat> you know? So I spent the next four months in the shoe fighting my case. And while I was in the shoe, I'm just gonna go through all the incidents that happened in the shoe that I don't have intimate details of because I'm stuck in the cell. And we only hear about it when you know people come through. Every week, the deuce is going off. We can hear the COs running out of the wreck, out of the shoe into the yard. A couple hours later, we hear people yelling, coming through the, um, being taken, coming through the shoe. They're yelling for their homies, letting them know, hey, whatever, whatever, hey, I'm in here, whoop, whoop, this and that. And then when we go out to rec, we find out what was going on. So the four months I was in the shoe, the vice lord stabbed one of their homies for trying to be a Muslim. I mentioned that. Then they had a Louisiana dude who went into a cell and killed his cell and killed his homeboy, another dude from Louisiana. I don't know what, why, rhyme or reason, but within that four month period, starting off with the Texas MA, when they stabbed up Pete, when they found out he was a rat in the shoot um, in the commissary, after that, the native smashed. One of the other natives that came in, he was a child killer, a baby killer, and they stomped his out, ass out, cracked his skull, brain leaked out on the steps, killed him. You know, we had four murders in the span of four months. And you know, in the penitentiary, you might be able to go through a period of calmness where everything's cool, everybody's getting along, but then out of nowhere is boom, 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 and it's just chaos after chaos 
at the chaos. So all this stuff is going on out there. I'm stuck in the shoe. I'm fighting for my freedom because the state of Utah has put warrants on me because they don't really want me back here, back home, you know. <clears throat> but I went to court, a video court with the judge, and it, it, they determined that the state violated my Fast and Speedy Trial Act because when they charge you, they have 90 days to take you to court, 90 days to take you to trial. But if you file any motion or if the prosecutor file any motion for whatever reason, for evidentiary hearing, for preliminary hearings, any of that stuff, it stops the clock. But there was no motion filed after I petitioned to get to court. After I petitioned my writ, my habeas corpus, the prosecutor never responded. He just disregarded it. So when the time came for them to try to prosecute me over it, the court, the law, everything determined that the state violated my fast and speedy trial act and they had to drop my case. And they had to drop it with prejudice. Now understand those two words. When they drop a case, one is without prejudice and the other one is with prejudice. If they drop your case, and they say, we're dropping this case without prejudice, that means they can bring that case back up. If they, found new, if they find new evidence, or whatever pertains to that case, they can bring that back up. But they dropped my case, all my case, with prejudice, so therefore, all that is done and over with. And, you know, may, you know my wife was telling me that I shouldn't be sharing these stories because... These are unresolved cases, but these cases are resolved. And any case outside of murder has a seven year lifespan, seven year statutory limitation. This stuff is real, I've been through it. So without further ado, I'm just gonna share one of the cases that they allege, that they charged me with, that they allege. So we're gonna make sure that the word allege is emphasized in this video. They allege that these people did these things. And the role that they said that I played in this robbery was a Circuit City robbery. Now, on our cases, we had people that testified against us, people that turned state evidence, also witnesses that came forward to confirm that this crime was committed. So, according to the testimony of the rat, they said that on this particular night, we was all hanging out, running around, just kicking in. We pulled into this gas station to get gas. But the gas station is in a parking lot where they have Circuit Cities, another department store, all around, whatever. It's about maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night. You know, all the stores are closing down. They said they were in the van, and at this time, it was about closing hours, and there was three people in Circuit City in the garage area that was finishing up. Two of them left, and one remained. When this last individual left, they said an individual approached them, which the informant said that was me, said that I approached this individual when he was trying to get into his car and pulled out a pistol on him and grabbed him and the dude said the dude tried to take off but he but he had it but he was driving a stick shift he was in a truck and the truck stalled on him so when that happened two other individuals pulled up and put a pistol on him at that time he cooperated they opened the door pulled the dude out and told him to, and took him back to the circuit city at that time, the informant said that I jumped in the truck, drove the truck to Circuit City and parked it in front of Circuit City while the two other individuals escorted this, the victim into Circuit City. So while they're over there trying to get into Circuit City, they said I was sitting in the truck being the lookout. But when they come back out, they come to the truck 
And the guy, the victim, says, hey, I can't open it up. So at that point, I supposedly said, are you sure you can't open that up? He said, yeah, I can't open that up. I said, all right, don't worry about it. Put him in the truck. And then the victim was like, no, 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 I can open it up. I can open it up. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, I can open it up. I can open it. I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to be out here. So if anything doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, you know what it is. So then the two suspects and the victim walk back to Circuit City and whatever code, whatever they did, the dude punched in the code or whatever, and they went to Circuit City. Now... I share this with you is not to glorify anything that's been done out in the streets or that's been allegedly done, but just the ignorance and dumb shit that you get caught up in in the moment that you think is cool, that you think is fun, that you think is exciting can change your whole outcome, can change your whole life. Like in my case, I was out for six months in 1998. For the six months period, I just ran wild. I mentioned all the cases that I was charged with. And none of, and I can tell you right here, right now, none of the things that I've done, none of the things that I've done during that time was worth a day of jail. But I didn't get a day of jail. I lost over two decades of my life. Because this is how stupid these people were. They went in there, they had the whole circuit city to themselves. And the things that were stolen were video games, a boom box, some more video games, CDs, dumb shit that they could just put in their pockets and carry out. You know, we got indicted in 2006 on a RICO, because a RICO, they consider us as an organized crime. Now, if that were true, think about that. Had the Circuit City for two hours, somebody could have pulled up a fucking U-Haul and emptied it out. But they didn't, because he was just dumb young kids running around doing shit that they thought was exciting and it was cool and it was thrilling. You know, all the people that was there at that time all went to prison. They all went to the state prison. You know, one of them did four years, another did seven years. Now, I say that to show you the difference between the feds and the state. This is armed robbery. This is armed robbery, kidnapping, felon in possession of firearms. So those that got convicted that their case stayed in the state, they went and did four years and seven years. I got an armed robbery charge in the feds for a bank. But it's the same. Whether it's a bank, whether it's a convenience store, whether, whether it's a department store, electronic store, or jewelry store, it's armed robbery. I had to do a minimum baseline of seven years for possession of a firearm in commission of a crime. And then they gave me 11 years for the actual robbery. But the people that went to the state, like I said, got four and seven years. The most, when we got arrested, there was 15 of us in connection with different cases. Some had robberies, some had shooting, some had bodies. Even the individuals that had bodies on our case, came home before me. All the ones that went to the state for robberies, the most they did was seven years. The one for the body did 18 years. I ended up doing 23 years and four months. You know, I share these stories again to really emphasize on the kind of choices that individuals make when they're younger as to oppose 
to when they're a middle-aged man like me. I've learned firsthand that none of the thrills, none of the money is worth losing your freedom. It's worth losing the time away from your family. It's worth watching your siblings, your parents grow older, grow old through photographs and watching everybody else live their lives on reality TV. You know, coming up soon, in a couple of days, on Saturday, I'm gonna launch my brand. I'm gonna launch my BMA brand. I'm gonna launch, I'm having a pop-up and a website. And as you know, I've shared with you guys before, you know, my brand is a mentality. You know, it's a mentality of conducting yourself with integrity. Like I really honor that all those words that people use for, take for granted and just use because it sounds good. Loyalty, honor, respect, love. I have a long ways to go still, but at this point in my life, I'm striving to live up to all those, all those things. And I hope that soon or whenever that eventually I'll get there. But for all those that watch me on YouTube, for you guys that enjoy my videos, man, I would love your support. Log on to my website on the 18th and show your love. I want to be able to get to, like I said, I've got all these stuff, all these electronic stuff, all the money that I've spent all that I've earned and saved up this last year that I've been out has been invested into this project. And my project is, the bigger scope of it is prison reform. Is showing the public that even someone like me, someone out here that was running wild, someone out here that was disrupting people's lives, just being a agent of chaos, that even someone like me can come to a point in their life that they recognize that the shit they were doing wasn't cool and still has something to contribute to the community. And that's my goal. My goal is to help those people that are coming home that really want to change because no doubt there's people that's never going to change. There's no doubt that there's people that loves the craziness, that loves the drama, that loves the chaos. For those individuals, I'm not here to judge them, but I can't do nothing with them. I can't help them. But for people like me, for the friends that I left behind, that might get a chance to come home someday, whether it's five years from now or ten years from now, and they want to do something different, I want to be, a, be in a position to help them. And I'm grateful for the audience that watch me every day, for the supporters and the subscribers here on YouTube. You know, this is a, a vehicle for me that I didn't see coming, that I didn't know was possible. And through this channel, I want to bring you a broader scope. I want to bring you these people that I've done time with that's done something with their lives. And I want you to hear their story from their mouths. These people that I've sat on the yard with, these people that I broke bread with, and they range from different races, from whites, blacks, Mexican, Puerto Ricans, Islanders, and all the rest. But everybody that I put on here with me, I'm stamping that these dudes are men of integrity, that these dudes are like-minded like myself. And you guys, and if they have other projects that they're doing, I encourage you to support them. And I hope I build, I'm hoping I'm able to bring you this content after the holidays. Thank you for all the love and all the support. Welcome to the USP.